Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Some claim that we in a new American gilded age or that a new feudalism is emerging, but it's a gilded feudalism with a difference because it's globalized. Wealth and the wealthy can easily cross national boundaries while walls are being built to hinder the movement of workers and the poor. Thirty years ago, in the Reagan era, Louis Lapham, who was then the editor of Harper's Magazine, wrote about this new Gilded Age in Money and Class in America. And that book is now being reissued in a new paperback edition by O.R. Books with a new foreword by Thomas Frank. Mr. Lapham has also written about related issues of trade and globalization in his introductory essay to the spring issue of his magazine, Lapham's Quarterly. I'm very pleased to welcome Louis Lapham to our show now for a discussion of the arcs of wealth and injustice. It's always a pleasure to see you. Leonard, it is always a pleasure to see you, too. Money and Class was originally published in 1988. What were your concerns then that prompted you to write that book? Well, I was trying to uh, free myself, free my own mind of a worship of money. <laughs> the Money is the elephant always in the room of the American conversation. I mean, and it is our one uh, abiding value. Weren't, uh, wasn't your grandfather, Louis Henry Lapham, one of the, the founders of Texaco? So he, yes, money was. was there from... Yes, yes, there was. And, the, uh, and I was brought up in a New England prep school and then... Yale College in the 50s and, and the... You didn't have to buy your way in? I didn't have to buy my... Well, I don't know. I mean, my... my uh, one of my great uncles uh, bought his way in, in, in somewhere around 1920. I mean, they... Nothing new. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the... Uh, I, the lecture was uh, from the, fa the faculty, uh, you gentlemen are going to inherit the earth and the... Uh, we want you to have a little culture so you know where you're going to be spending the money. Right? <laughs> you buy the right paintings. <laughs> and I, I kept thinking, uh, why do I have to pay this much, much respect to money? I mean, the, uh, and, and the, the more money, if it becomes the supreme value, is, is, uh, leads to profound stupidity. <laughs> I mean, people have known this for thousands of years. I mean, it shows up in the Greek philosophers, it shows up in the Bible. Uh, but I was watching it at work in, 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 in the American society in the 80s. I mean, Reagan was elected, if you remember, in, in 1980 with the promise that this is going to be, uh, with an agenda not unlike uh, uh, Trump's. Uh, this is, I'm going to bring America back to where it was, a country where everybody can always get rich. I but mean, even er earlier, the, the 50s and 60s when you were growing up were a time of social and political upheaval. And a number of young people uh, from wealthy families started to reexamine their legacies yes. then. Yes, yes, they did. Was that something that was discussed in college? Or well, were yes, the good it, schools you were going to uh, it was, before you went to college? Not before I went to college, but certainly at college there was a, uh, a loyal opposition. There was a sort of a bohemian counter culture avant-garde among the uh, students at Yale in 1952-56. And th those became the people that I uh, 
hung around with, and also on the weekends, I, I would, um, instead of going to the football games, I think I only saw one in four years, but the uh, I, I would go to the village, and the, uh, I was interested in jazz, I was studying uh, the piano, and the, I had a friend who was a magnificent I mean, a classmate, who, uh, jazz pianist, and he, and he knew everybody in New York, so we'd go down and we'd listen to Monk and and uh, <laughs> I, saw, I saw Bud so, Powell when he came in from France at that time. It was an incredible time to see jazz in New York. It was, and and uh, Eaton, my friend, that knew knew many of these people. Mm. Uh, but he was also Eaton was also a uh, student of the classical piano. So sometimes we'd go to. Uh, Carnegie Hall and listen to Richter play the piano. Now, you mentioned that Ronald Reagan uh, shared many or uh, uh, had many uh, attitudes that were similar to, to Trump's. Yeah. He, uh, he left office in, in 1988, and that's when this book was published. Uh, didn't Donald Trump show up at a dinner party thrown by Ann Getty when the book came out? Yes. I mean, Trump in 1988 was the hero of the age. I mean, he was a uh, darling of, of, of the media. He, he's, in 1988, his photograph was on the cover of Time magazine, also on the cover of Playboy magazine. And at Yale in, in the 80s, students who in the 60s on their walls would have had photographs of Dylan and Che. In, in, in 1988, the photograph on the wall was Trump. Hmm. And something like half the class uh, of Yale in 1988 uh, applied for jobs at, at Morgan Stanley. <laughs> what, what, was, what was Trump's appeal, that, that he was rich? Yeah, that he was rich. And, Which he you know, tells us all the time. Yeah, and that, that he was the ace of diamonds. I mean, that, that's the uh, that, that's how he was posed on the cover of, uh, um, of Time. And so when the book came out, Ann Getty, who was the pu publisher of the book, uh, she had bought a firm called uh, Weidenfeld Nicholson, which had contracted the book, and she gave a party in her apartment on Fifth Avenue and invited Trump just because Trump was kind of the best table ornament one could possibly have in, in, in 1988. And what was right? your take on him at the time? Well, I mean, he was, my take on him was, was that he was, uh, I couldn't believe that uh, uh, the extent of the Willful ignorance and grotesque vanity. I mean, I listened to him talk at the table, and it was uh, embarrassing. But the but everybody knew that in New York at that time. I mean, it, 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 the idea that Trump is a surprise, <laughs> I find. Uh, and I thought, okay, if this man is the spirit of the age, uh, I, I figured it, it would was on its final approach to a sell-by date. I mean, I, 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 this couldn't last. And then to my, and I assumed that um, the uh, the entire country in, in 1988 was, was uh, wishing for the Midas touch. They, everybody wanted to turn themselves into gold, right? I mean, and, I mean 1988 is the same year as, as Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities and uh, Oliver Stone's Wall Street. Uh, the, the the society was just uh, bewitched by its its um, faith in money. So, are you saying this was the beginning of the the process that we have seen developing ever since, or wouldn't it even go back earlier, perhaps to Barry Goldwater? Well, it can go back, sure. I mean, or, or, or opposition to the New Deal uh, when, yes, when yes. FDR proposed it. It does. We're hearing similar arguments today. Right, and 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 that's an, that was the other platform of, of Reagan's election was to take down the whole style of democratic thought and feeling 
that was the, the basis of, of, of Roosevelt's New Deal. No, the, the, the devotion to wealth is, is, recurs in, in American society over the last uh, 200 odd years. I mean, it's, it's the first Gilded Age, the one that is described by Thorsten Bel- Beblin in his wonderful book, The Theory of the Lever- Leisure Class, is equally, at, and Mark Twain is, mm. you know, coins the phrase Gilded Age in a book that he publishes in 1874. And he says that uh, a society so besotted by you know, greed, it, a society uh, that adds to nothing more than the sum of its vanity and greed is not a society at all. It is a state of war. That's Twain, 1874. But historically, haven't Americans insisted that ours is a classless society? Yes. Um, <laughs> is dynastic wealth growing even more than it did in the past, or are we just seeing it differently? Well, we've always been a classless, uh, we've always been a class society, I mean, and that was, that was true at, at, at the, uh, at the beginning. <laughs> are we a class society? Yes, yeah, certainly. But class in America is, is defined only in terms of money. I mean, it's, we're not a class society, it's not based on blood or on family and inheritance. It, it's based on uh, uh, cash. Um, there have been numbers of books about this, and, and Cleveland Avery wrote one of the marvelous books about this in the 1950s. The, the uh, you know, you can still, if, if you're the, you can be a great grandson of, of a very rich family, but if you run out of money, <laughs> you're no longer in the, in, the, in the game. You're no longer a member of the club. But uh, well, eugenics was once uh, an important part of the way we saw the world. Yeah. Um, and in the past, the elite embraced stories of divine right and superiority. Uh, haven't those been replaced now with arguments of biological or genetic superiority? For example, 10 years ago, not all that long ago, Harvard economist Gregory Manco uh, wrote that quote, smart parents make more money and pass those good genes on to their offering, offspring. And he's made similar claims since. Um, that sounds to me like a, a new form of eugenics. Well, uh, that's, that also has been around a long time. I mean, Voltaire, uh, supposed champion of, of enlightenment human rights, is a very clear uh, White supremacist. I mean, he he makes no secret of, of thinking that uh, white people are superior to uh, black people. I mean, and the uh, so that notion of of somehow being favored at birth uh, by skin color. I mean, that, I mean, I mean that attitude is is white supremacy is is fundamental to to the. Uh, thinking of of Andrew Jackson. But in this case, uh, the thinking is, if your father and mother were wealthy, that means that they were superior, that otherwise they wouldn't have developed that wealth, and so you are born with with better genes. I I never got that into that point. I mean, I I was born because the... uh, I was superior because the, the... Family could afford to live in Pacific Heights in San Francisco, and and the uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, and, and it, it was as simple as that. It, it really wasn't. It, I, I I missed the the whole eugenics lecture. I'm speaking with Lewis Lapham on Leonard Lopez at Large on WBAI ninety nine point five. FM in New York, and we have, I have two books in front of me, one a reissue of his 1988 book, which suddenly seems incredibly relevant again, called Money and Class in America, and also the latest of his, uh, his magazine, now almost 10 years old, Lapham's uh, Quarterly, this one devoted to trade, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but the subtitle of the first edition of your book was Notes on Our Civil Religion. What 
was or is our civil religion? Well, I mean, I, again, I mean, it's the, it's the Ambrose Bierce put it, uh, it's the worship of mammon. It, it's the uh, it, it's the almost uh, religious devotion to large sums of of, of wealth. The, the idea that a, a rich man, because he is rich, is also wise, <laughs> is, is is I mean, I mean, the love of money is all over the world. I mean, it's not a unique and American. Uh, uh, in fact, Attribute. inequality is growing around the world. Has the American view of money and, and wealth uh, been an influence? Uh, yes, certainly I would think so. The, the, um, yes, I mean, we've made it very clear that that's uh, our, our supreme value. I mean, our whole consumer society is built on that idea, on the, the pursuit of happiness the pursuit of happiness, happiness as defined in the 18th century, when Jefferson puts it into the Declaration of Independence, is defined as power, pleasure, and profit. That's the understanding of the, of the word happiness in the 18th century. So we, we uh, can we can actually trace a lot of what we're talking about back to the founding oh, fathers. Oh, yeah, no, no question about it. I mean, the, the uh, freedom, well, when they talk about liberty, um, the, uh, what the, the phrase is uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But by liberty, they mean what the British economic philosopher John Locke meant it was liberty for property, not liberty for persons. That it, the idea of liberty for persons just does not occur to uh, the founders of, of, of the American Republic. I mean... And they spent, uh, as they were debating the Constitution, the founders paid special attention to issues of property and debt. Yes. Uh, yes. uh, and, and which you say they, they inherited from British thinkers. <coughs> yeah, they did. <coughs> Even though the whole idea was to break with everything British. Well, <coughs> yes, but also to acquire British property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to walk away empty-handed from that break. And of course, they were also defending slavery. Uh, well, yes, slavery. I mean they did. I mean, I mean they, they talk about constitutional. I mean, they talk about uh, all men being created equal, but they didn't. Um, they believed that in theory, but not in practice. I mean, in the I was writing about this the other day, and I came across across a quotation by Cotton Mather talking to his uh, to the lesser folk in the congregation in, in, uh, in uh, Cambridge or Boston where he says uh, to the indentured servants in, in the midst, he said, uh, you are slaves. I own your hands and your feet are mine. Or your masters, not mine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Franklin didn't feel that the people in... in uh, Philadelphia were equal. I mean, the the uh, he thought of the rummaging in the scrap heap of of what the uh, early founders called waste people. These are people that came over as indentured servants from uh, swept out of the the. Uh, sewers of, of London. And, and well, but, but everywhere, the first uh, Africans who were brought here were brought here as indentured servants. Slavery was instituted a little later Yeah, no, the, 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 as an extension of that. Yeah, I mean... They couldn't buy their way out as they, the, indentured no. servants could. Yeah. And the, you know, the opening of the, the settlement of the West in the, in the first, first half of the 19th century, it's a, they're trying to the, the, the West is understood as a safety valve where to get rid of, of uh, 
possibly dangerous black people. It's interesting that Benjamin Rush, I don't know if you know yeah, about yeah, Dr. Know, Benjamin yeah. Rush, he was an anomaly. He was uh, a an abolitionist. He was for equal rights for women. He was for uh, free medical uh, treatment of the poor and keeping the, the poor areas clean so that disease wouldn't uh, spread. But... <laughs> Uh, but he was a lone voice. No. Obviously, people uh, it occurred to people. Uh, Tom Paine also. Mm-hmm. It occurs and and to they Payne. collaborated, Tom Paine and yeah. Ben Troy. When Paine first comes to America at the invitation of Franklin as a, to become a journalist, I mean, the, the first newspaper uh, columns written arguing for, for equal rights for women and, and freedom for the slaves are, are by Paine. But he's a friend of Rush. You, you have a shocking photograph in the current issue of, of uh, Lapham's Quarterly of Price Birch and Company's building. Uh, it says Price Birch and Company dealers in slaves. Right. No, it was, it, a, it was a big business. And it was run that way, and, and people were not shy about advertising the uh, John This Locke. is from Virginia. You know, <laughs> yeah, the John Locke himself, the, the British... Economic philosopher, uh, what, uh, was a major stockholder in, in, in the largest uh, slave trading uh, corporation running out of it, Liverpool. Now, <laughs> after your book came out um, in 1988, uh, Reagan's presidency was followed by George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and now Donald Trump. How much has changed over those 30 years? I don't think much. I mean, I, I think the uh, uh, Brandeis, J- Justice Brandeis appointed in, you know, in the 1920s by uh, Supreme Court Justice, says to Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, we can have... uh, Can I give you the exact quote? Because I've written it down. Yes, read it down. He he wrote, we must make our choice. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. He's right. And, and uh, And that was understood as far back in our history, John Adams says almost the same thing to Jefferson in their correspondence in in the first decades of the 19th century. And we, this is recognized. I mean, what... But what, haven't we had both? Since, yes. Uh, since we, the, the, the beginning of this country? Uh, we've tried to find a balance what the what the founders are trying to do with the Constitution is to balance a democratic society with a capitalist economy. That's a hard thing to do, and it requires people willing to pay attention. And it, Madison says that it has it has it it's a, a government by people with the most. Uh, wisdom to discern and the most virtue to pursue the common good of the society. And he expressed the thought that there would be a constant tinkering with this mechanism. And and there have been times in, in the history of the country when we have tinkered with it. The, the New Deal is, 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 is one point. In, and, in and, and FDR was came out of wealth. Yeah. So was he being a traitor to his class? There were, pe- there were many people that a- a- accused him of, of that. I mean, they were, I can still remember the, my elders, in, I'm born in 1935, and I, I grew up in San Francisco during World War II, and I can still uh, hear some of my, you know, fathers and and grandfather's generation talking as did the um, 
Republican opposition to the New Deal. I mean, it's still, still talking about uh, um, Ro- Roosevelt as, you know, a communist. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, there's always been a, this kind of an opposition in it. Actually, he was country. he was trying to come up with a corrective yes, to, the, to the yeah. uh, in, and, inequality and, in our societies to save capitalism. That's correct. That's correct. You write, uh, and, and now that uh, that Trump's quote, and I'm quoting you, smug and self satisfied face is the face of the way things are and have been in Washington and Wall Street for the last quarter of a century. Um, what happened 35 years ago in 1994? Was does Newt Gingrich play a part in this story? No, I mean it, it's the the uh, Trump didn't read Brandeis. He didn't read politics. I mean, well, we know he doesn't he read. He doesn't actually. read. So, but he was never in any doubt that money is the good, true, and beautiful. And I'm. My point is that, that that same assumption was shared by H.W. Bush, by Clinton, by G.W. Bush, and, and by Obama, and, and by Trump. I mean, it, it, it's, we haven't gotten, we haven't had a new way in the last 30 or 40 years of thinking about the relation between um, um, between the rich and the poor. I mean, it's that simple. A I mean, common argument is that people like Trump, Bloomberg, Whitman, Fiorina, are were successful in business, so they know how to run things. And Trump yes, but, uh, bragged but, the, that he's really rich. I know he did, and and when. George W. Bush became president. He, he said he's going to run it like a corporation. The problem is that it, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I mean, politics is not business. I mean, it, it's 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 a different uh, skill. And, and the uh, if you try to run it like a business, you end up with what we've got now, which is a plutocracy. I mean, business is always going to make the decision in in, in favor of, of of the bottom line. I mean, you you cannot run a, a, a society or hold together a uh, polity if all you've got is the doctrine of the bottom line. Louis Lapham is my guest today, and uh, we have two things uh, that we are considering a reissue of his book, Money and Class in America, with a new foreword by Thomas Frank, uh, who has wondered in his own work what's happened to America, especially in the Midwest, and also the latest edition of Lapham's Quarterly uh, with the spring 2019 edition, which um, is uh, headed trade, because each one of... The, the magazines uh, focuses on a different topic? Yes, the magazine is, uh, it's, we've been doing it for 10 years. It's a quarterly, it's a very uh, beautiful object. I think you will agree to that. I, right? I, I see it as a, uh, a collection of, of essays, many of them by, uh, uh, by the, the great thinkers of, of uh, Yes. past 2,000 years, but not necessarily well-known ones, uh, with really interesting sidebars and great illustrations. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like I, a pretty good combination. Well, yeah, I think it is. It's 224 pages, and it's, there's no advertising, and it's a perfect spine, and it's filled with illustration, art, uh, painting, sculpture, photography, taken over the past. It's a compendium of texts taken from or, or focused on a, on a topic that's in the news. In other words, we've done, done issues on death, religion, uh, uh, money, war, 
You don't think you're going to run out of topics? No, we're not going to run out of topics. And the, the current one is trade, and the idea is, is to bring to bear on, on the topic in the news as to where we are now with to bring us up to date with the story so far. So but you go all the way back to Cicero. We go, sure, Pliny we go, the Elder. We go back to Pl- Pliny the Elder. We go back to Cicero. In, in this issue on trade, we have Joseph Conrad, Max Weber, Francis Rabelais, Fernand Brodel, Eduardo Galliano, mm-hmm. David Ricardo. I mean, it, Hilary Mantel. I mean, it, it, the writing is uniformly good. I, I, I don't have to agree or disagree with what anybody's saying. It's just that it has to be written well and that it is all focused on whatever the point is in your discussion. So there are a lot of different sides of the argument. And um, we get come back to globalization because so much of the story of trade has yeah. been about globalization, whether it was the Chinese, whether it was all the trade, the spice trade and the like from the Middle East, whether it was the Colombian exchange that Spain and Portugal uh, brought about that really changed European history. Um, yes. Africa, the colonization of Africa. Right. Uh, all of that uh, has played a major role in how politics are conducted oh, today. W- without any question. I mean, it's... it's- played a major role in how politics have been conducted for the last 4,000 years. I mean, the, the, the Trojan War is a trade war. <laughs> so I just thought they were horsing around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, uh, you, you don't take advertising, and uh, I've been asked to mention that you have a, a fundraiser coming up, a fundraising gala. Yeah. Uh, the Decades Ball. That's true. Uh, on the 25th of this month. Uh, one word plug before we move on back to the topics at hand? Well, we give the annual ball every year and we take a different decade. We've taken the 1780s, we've taken the 1590s, we've taken the 1920s, and this year it's the 1960s. And why not do take advertising? I know why WBAI doesn't take advertising. It, Same it, reason? You don't want to be influenced? No, it, it's not worth it. I mean, our, our circulation is roughly... 40,000, which is a large circulation for this kind of a magazine. But you can't make any money with it. It isn't worth the the trouble. I mean, the the advertisers only pay substantial money for very large circulation. They want a million. Yeah. A million readers. Yeah. You open your preamble uh, in the current issue of the magazine with a quote from Hannah Arendt, uh, who is writing this 50 years ago, although it sounds like it could have been written today. Quote, in the era of imperialism, businessmen became politicians and were acclaimed as statesmen, while statesmen were taken seriously only if they talked the language of successful businessmen. Uh, Wow. Uh, The the, the difference is, uh, well, do the business leaders even have to be particularly successful these days? Uh, well, they have to at least pretend to be. <laughs> Claim that they're, they're, yeah. they're very rich. But that goes back to the point that you made earlier about, uh, you know, running a, a country like a business or running a country like a corporation. It, it, we got into that habit uh, be, because of the um, amount of wealth we were producing and, and prosperity. And, and the it, it doesn't really give you very many uh, it doesn't produce a, a uh, healthy politics if you try to run it as a, as a, as a business well many members of Congress uh, uh, many politicians throughout the country are wealthier than average Americans that's been true for at least 40 years so how well can they represent average Americans when their own circumstances are so different and and we're talking about uh, a bipartisan situation uh, Democrats like Richard Blumenthal and Diane Feinstein Feinstein I guess no. are uh, very very wealthy in fact they are among a group uh, half the collective net worth of Congress is held by about 12 members and they are among those <laughs> yeah, I know 
Well, it makes it hard for them to uh, understand their fellow citizens because if you, uh, I mean, one of the problems with our politics is that, and this was another reason that Trump got elected, is the disconnect between the uh, permanent government in, in, in Washington, which, which is run uh, uh, a government by and for uh, the rich. And, and that's been true for quite a long time. And the, so uh, the Diane Feinsteins of the world tend not to know who, 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 who their fellow Americans are. They, they have more in common with their uh, rich counterparts in, in uh, London or, or Paris or Berlin or Dubai than they do with their, uh, somebody they like to uh, meet on the wrong side of town. But they often are reelected. Uh, upstate New York Representative Chris Collins is worth over $40 million and he was reelected last November despite having been arrested on insider trading charges last August. So um, I guess... Uh, well, I mean, you know, again, we, we think that, I mean, r to be rich is, is to be a celebrity. So maybe, maybe the... Um, uh, I have no idea why he's getting elected. I, <laughs> I, I can see why Trump got elected. Trump got elected by saying uh, the only thing that counts is money. And money is power, and it's not democratic. And uh, one uh, explanation for his success with his base is even though they recognize that he has many faults because uh, they've been in the news, they see him as a game changer, and they feel yeah. that what he's going to do will change things permanently, and then they can get somebody that they feel a little more comfortable with in the future. Yes, no, they, they, the press loved him. I mean, the press made him. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you have to... You have to understand that, that the, uh, you, you remember Leslie Moons or whatever his name is, the CBS guy. He was talking in the primary, and he said that Trump may be bad for the country, but he's very, very good for CBS. Uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, so the, the, the press made a fortune out of, money, out, out of Trump, and, and, the, uh, and they played him as a uh, lone... Uh, gunslinger type figure. I mean, they, they kind of put him in the same category with Clint Eastwood or uh, the great robber barons, the guys coming out of nowhere to fix up the crooked sheriff and clean up the town and, and distribute justice and clear the swamp and so forth, right? I mean, he had no intention of doing that, but 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 that's the that was the mythos of, 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 of his uh, election campaign. A friend and admirer of President Trump sent him a handwritten note opening with Dear King. Have right. um, any polls uh, been conducted to determine whether there is much sentiment for a monarchy in this country? Or well, uh, is that just a subtext? Well, that is a subtext. I mean, the, uh, I published a group of essays, you know, 10 or 15 years ago called The Wish for Kings. And the, uh, as the other thing that, that has been going on for the last 40 odd years is the loss of faith in, in democracy. Democracy isn't up to the task of, uh, cleaning up the world or defending us against our enemies or, uh, you know, keeping the trains on time. I mean, it, it, there's never, I mean, to make a, a perfect democracy is hopeless but with the, because it's so difficult. But the idea, you, you try for that idea is, is it's the aspiration more than it is the... Um, uh, uh, fact in itself. I mean, power 
all power is corrupt, but some power must govern. I mean, it, it, <laughs> what the, well, what's happened, I think, in, in, in the United States and, in the, and, and it's happening elsewhere in the world it, is the loss of faith in the, in the notion of democratic government. It's, it's not efficient enough. It, it doesn't uh, do, it can't protect us. So that's and, why we're seeing this neo-fascist movement well, yeah, in, in much of Europe. Well, yeah, that, but that is the wish for Brazil kings. as well. That's the wish for kings. Now, right? Judge T.S. T. S. Ellis III sentenced Paul Manafort to what many consider a very light sentence for a string of guilty verdicts. And he claimed that Manafort had led a blameless life before committing his crimes. Does Rich make right in the United States? Somebody joked that the sentence would have been a lot harsher if... The defendant's name had been Kwame Manafort or or Juan Manafort. Well, I mean, the uh, I, yes, I, I I think that there is a uh, different uh, distribution of justice, just the way there is a different distribution of wealth, and I think that the distributions fall along more or less the same lines. You can say that the you know the rule of law in the United States is the divine right of money. Well, things seem to have changed. Uh, the uh, a growing number of uh, changes and reforms made in the decades after World War II, uh, including LBJ's Great Society, have been reversed since in the years since the Reagan administration, since you wrote this book. I'm, I'm not sure which. Well, well, I mean, well little by little, we uh, we had wealth, so-called welfare reform. We had all sorts of other things that uh, uh, much of uh, of LBJ's Great Society has, is yeah. being undercut. And yes, now there's no, talk of getting rid of Medicare. And yes, that's right. Yeah. No, that's the, now considering your own family background. Do you think that the U.S. needs to implement something like? The wealth tax that's been uh, suggested by Elizabeth Warren, uh, or a top marginal tax rate of 70%, as proposed by Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Uh, well, I, we I, I'm thinking back to wasn't the, the ta top rate quite high during the post World War II economic boom? I, I think it was up to 90%. It was, a, it was a 90%. And I can remember my, my own family being very. Uh, uh, Content with that? Well, the, well, there were a lot of loopholes, so well, nobody actually paid ninety yeah, percent. Yes, there were a lot of loopholes, but but it was understood that the, uh, uh, the that kind of a tax was was uh, fair. So I, I I think there should be a some sort of tax on whatever you decide to be excessive wealth. Some economists like Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen have argued that. The commonly uh, used sense of wealth as GDP is too narrow. Do we need to change our conception of wealth? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing we have to do if we're going to. Uh, yeah, if because capitalism left to its own devices will destroy the earth. I mean, it's, yes. So no, we we do. Uh, and the great speech about that was made. Well, climate change, by the way, will well, climate, may destroy the world. Well, and, and many of the arguments uh, by climate change deniers uh, are based on capitalist assumptions. But am I wrong? Wait, wait a minute. By com but because you would say it hurts business, it's. Uh, oh yeah, sure, that's right, and, and yes. But but. Uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy made a very fine speech along these lines, I think, in some, you know, like 1964 or earlier, I think, in Kansas City, and he was talking about GDP. What, what does GDP really mean? I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't count for any of the things that, that uh, make people healthy, wealthy, and wise. I mean, it doesn't count imagination. It doesn't count mind, it doesn't count art, it doesn't count work. It, 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 I mean, the kind of work in which people find meaning, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's based on a, 
system of double bookkeeping that was invented in the late 15th century by an Italian monk. Hmm. And the, uh, it, it was like it goes back it, that far. It goes back, and we're still using it. No, you write. <laughs> 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 that, you know, you write that the rich are increasingly frightened. I think so. In one of his books, Joseph Stiglitz described hearing wealthy guests at a party speculate about the return of the guillotine. Um, but um, haven't many Americans across the econo economic spectrum? Um, come to accept this extreme inequality? I, I well, I, I think so. I mean, I think when that's people the people aren't marching in the streets. No, but they um, Americans have have always been kind of expectant capitalists. I mean, we're not going to plunder the rich because we live in the hope that we ourselves will get rich. If you see what I mean. I mean, that's been, we too will hit the lottery or, we, or we'll make an app that'll make us rich. I mean, the, the, yeah. But the, recently, the rich have been pushing it a little too far. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, um, you know, the gated communities, the surveillance cameras, the emphasis, the, the word public used to, in, infer a kind of common good. I mean, when I was growing up in, in, in the 50s and into the 60s, public spirit, public servants, public square, right? And private was a word that was associated with pigs at troughs and, 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 you know, Wall Street guys with top hats and pig bellies and so on. And the meaning reversed. In, in the 70s. And Do you know why? Was it just... Yes, I know why, because the... Well, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know anything, but I can guess. Right? Because what happens in the 70s is you have a real... Richard break. Nixon becomes president, but he gives us the EPA, he gives us the Clean Water Act, and... Uh, I know, but I mean, what's going on in the society is 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 a, is a real revolution. I mean, a revolution in terms of gender... Uh, communities are breaking up. Jobs are being set. I mean, this is when, when the uh, community values begin to lose uh, uh, force. And the idea that there was no history, that was another idea that came out of the 60s. There's hmm. been nobody... The end would, of history. Yeah, and the end of history. And, and there's a feeling of... of uh, uh, rootlessness that takes hold, and the only value left is is uh, the only port in the storm seems to be money. I mean that that happens in the seventies, if you remember. And the so I forget where this started, but the the uh, and and the drifting apart of you know private and, and public. I mean, all of a sudden, private becomes the the true, the good, and the beautiful, and public becomes uh, disease, foreigners, you know, public toilet, and so on. I mean, I mean it, and that was not helped by by Reagan, who was constantly talking about breaking down the government and the government's incompetent and the and so privatization on. was going to bring yeah, more efficiency yeah, yeah, yeah. to government. Yeah, because. Go, because businesses run more efficiently than government, yeah. but well, it, it hasn't turned out that way. No, yet. no. But it's made it's made a certain uh, kind of you know it, it's made uh, the financial uh, powers uh, extremely extremely rich. Now you also quote Joseph Conrad, one of my favorite writers, uh, in the spring issue of your quarterly. Uh, in his great 1904 novel Nostromo, the American industrialist Holroyd, uh, Holroyd says, I'm quoting, time itself has got to wait on the greatest country in the whole of God's universe. We shall be giving the word for everything, industry, trade, law, journalism, art, politics, and religion. 
we shall run the world's business whether the world likes it or not. Right. Could time be on the verge of giving up on the world's only indispensable nation? Uh, yes, it Now is. that China is gaining on it? Yes, and and the the other the other thing that's happening, I mean, I use that to introduce the essay in, in the trade issue. I talk about I I quote that from Conrad, and I also quote the uh, Hannah Arendt, and then I go to the this winter issue of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. which is devoted to the question, who runs the world? Right, and and so you have a lot of concerned uh, bankers and economists and uh, po uh, politicians. Even Elizabeth Warren is in the issue, uh, bemoaning the fact that they no longer run the world. <laughs> and uh, and because, why, why should anybody run the world? I'm well, the exactly. point. Yeah, <laughs> that's another. Well. Again, you go back to American history and you go back to the idea of the infinite future. I'm reading a book now by a guy named Greg Grandin about the myth of the American frontier. Mm. And the idea was that we were continually going to expand. It was, it was always moving, uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, until we were going to run the world. I mean, yeah. that kind of idea is not only in the head of Jackson in the 1830s, but it's also in the, in the head of Jefferson. By the way, that book, he's going to come on our show. Oh, you'll like that book. Yeah. It's a good one. He's it's going to come on my ahead. show, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, we should mention that you have a podcast. How do people I, I do. find your podcast? Through, through the website for the to the quarterly. But, uh, but again, I mean, you bring up these questions with Grandin because he he really does a lovely job of it in this book. We we'll plan to. That's why okay. we booked him on the show. We, uh, as you've noticed, we have a full hour to actually get I know. into these topics uh, yeah. in a rather deep way. Um, in the little time that we have left, <laughs> the big question is, could climate change prove to be the fly in everybody's ointment? Yes, I think it can. I mean, I, I think it, it can offer enough uh, uh, evidence of a need for change. It, it can force uh, a redrafting of our relation between man and nature. But it's being used, it's been a polarizing thing in politics right now. I, I know and, it has. And supporters of a, 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 a new green approach are being uh, ridiculed. Well, not, not entirely. I mean, you, you know, I mean, I. I saw there have been a couple of columns that have said, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this goes too far, this is too extreme, it's not thought out, but at least these people uh, are beginning to raise questions that have to be raised. I mean, I, I don't know what the bill looks like, or it's not a bill, it's a resolution. Yeah proposed by Markey and, and uh, AOC, but the, my, my sense of it is that so far it's, it's, it's rhetoric without, a, without uh, much reality to it. But, well, but there's there always is a, a first. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> yes. And, uh, well, the UN has, uh, has tried to, to push it. There was the Paris Accord. None of that seems to be having much of an effect. It's much harder to do than one thinks. I mean, it's it's not it's, and it's not something that can be solved, I, by politics or by technology. It's something that has to be, in it entails a change of heart, and a change of mind. It's a cultural uh, question. I mean, the. <coughs> It, 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 we have to have a new idea of what we mean by politics, what we mean by America, and what we mean by uh, civilization. I mean, all those words are up for reconsideration. And I wonder, in 
just the, my last question. Uh, you're in the Editor's Hall of Fame, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do you think of yourself first as an editor or as a, a writer? Or? Well, I, because I think of myself as a writer. I, I became editor of the magazine, long, of, of Harper's Magazine, a long time ago in 1975 because I then took up writing a column every month, and I thought, okay, uh, this gives me a chance to learn educate myself in public, you know, uh, and writing the column. And, and, I, and because I wasn't having to adjust it, what I was thinking uh, to fit a, some other editor's ideas, I, mean, I, I learned to make my own mistakes. Lewis Lapham's uh, 1988 book, Money and Class in America has just been reissued in paperback by O.R. with a, a, a forward by Thomas Frank and a new introduction by the author. Uh, there's also the latest issue of Lapham's Quarterly, uh, Spring 2019, devoted to trade. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Leonard, thank you for having me. I love your show. <laughs> And that does bring us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to Lewis Lapham, to Hugh Sansom, who produced today's segment, to my producer, Jesse Lent, who was at the audio controls today, and to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music. Special thanks to Kevin O'Donohue, Nasima, and Alex Lopez, and the Positive Mind Center for allowing us to use their first-rate studio facilities. Modern Lopez and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large Podcasts on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs>